Hello everyone, good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Professor Sarah Patterson and I am going to chair this evening's discussion about corporate governance and responsible investment in private equity. So my first and I think my principal task this evening is to introduce our extremely um, distinguished panel. So to my left I have Dr. Simon Whitney who is a senior consultant at the London-based law firm Travis Smith. As many of you will know, he's also a visiting practice at the LSE and he teaches our extremely popular course in private equity on the LLM program. So I will be making a cameo appearance uh, together with Sean at the end of the program, but many of, you, many of you will already have met Simon in that context. So his doctoral thesis, completed at the LSE in 2017, was on corporate governance in private equity-backed companies and formed the basis of his really fabulous book, Corporate Governance and Responsible Investment in Private Equity, available from all good booksellers. Um, Simon's uh, previously served in senior positions within the British Private Equity and Venture Capital Association, the BBCA, including as chair of the Legal and Accounting Committee, and I think until a few days ago, Simon, um, as a member of its council. He's also a past chair of Invest Europe's Tax, Legal and Regulatory Committee. And then on my right, I have Peter Dunbar. Peter is head of private equity at Principles for Responsible Investment, where he leads the UN-supported Principles for Responsible Investments work in private equity, encouraging the PE industry to incorporate ESG issues into investment analysis, decision-making, and ownership practices. Prior to joining PRI, he worked for over a decade at Capital Group Private Markets and has substantial experience in a range of private markets business areas, including ESG, investor relations, fundraising, operations, corporate strategy, and portfolio analytics. So I think you will agree that we simply couldn't be in better hands for tonight's topic. Um, the order of events, uh, Dr. Whitney is going to speak first, probably for around 30 minutes. Uh, then we will have a response from Peter, possibly a little bit of a dialogue, and then I will open up for questions from the room. So without further ado, Simon, over to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction, and thank you so much uh, for coming this evening. It's a cold Monday evening. I really appreciate you uh, being here, and, and thank you to those who've joined online, and, and welcome. Um, it really is a pleasure to be talking to you this evening about the subject of my book. Um, as Sarah says, recently published in paperback as well, so a real bargain uh, on Amazon, uh, and indeed um, it's also uh, my favorite subject, which is the corporate governance of private equity-backed companies. Um, I, I should make it clear uh, that although, as Sarah said, I work for Travis Smith and have until recently been a member of the BBCA Council, I'm speaking only for myself this evening. Um, I'm a lawyer. I've been advising uh, private equity firms and, to some extent, private equity-backed companies for uh, nearly 30 years. And throughout that time, I have been an admirer of the private equity model. I actually first encountered the private equity model when I did my MBA back in the 1990s. And at that time, I became convinced that as an ownership model for a certain type of company, it was superior to many other corporate models. But that doesn't mean that I think the private equity model is perfect, of course. Uh, nothing's perfect, but, and we, we have to identify and work hard to pick to fix any imperfections in the private equity model. Uh, we need to curb abuses of it. But I am convinced that both in theory and more often than not in practice, the model helps companies to grow and develop, to become more successful in the long term. Now, I know this isn't a universally held view of private equity. That might be something of an understatement. Uh, private equity certainly doesn't have a great press uh, in certain quarters. So what's driving this conviction of mine that it is a good ownership model? Well, it comes from both my academic work and my observation of the industry's practices over, as I say, quite a long period. I'm persuaded that the increased managerial accountability, the alignment of interest, the laser-like focus on strategic and operational improvements over a defined period, and that's important, mean that decision makers in private equity backed companies are often, in fact usually, very good at creating more valuable businesses. 
more efficient businesses, more profitable businesses, and more resilient businesses. On that latter point, which might seem like a surprising claim that private equity-backed companies are more resilient, we'll see the evidence in a few years' time from uh, the COVID pandemic uh, as to how well private equity-backed companies withstood that crisis and how that compared with their peers. But my hunch from observing private equity firms' behaviour over the last few years is that they'll come out of it well, just as the evidence shows, the academic evidence shows, that, that UK-backed companies, UK private equity-backed companies, uh, did, did well during the 2007-2008 financial crisis in comparison to their peers. And I might talk a little bit uh, later about why I think that's the case. But in my book, I also talk about how we would expect this ownership and governance model to affect society at large. Not, not just the private equity firms and their own investors, who benefit from creating these more valuable businesses, but other stakeholders, indeed the world at large. Would we expect private equity-backed companies to be more or less responsible corporate citizens, to be more or less responsive to societal concerns like climate change, human rights, unequal pay, unsafe or exploitative working practices at home and abroad? And since writing my book, of course, concerns about these matters have become even more important, even more topical. Indeed, in my work as a practicing lawyer, I now mainly focus on helping private capital firms understand and apply a wall of sustainable finance regulation. So I'm going to say something later on about my views on these hugely important questions. First, I just wanted to clarify a couple of definitional things. To begin with, what do I mean by a private equity firm? And why do we think, why do I think, private equity matters to the European economy? So first, uh, what is a private equity firm? Well, for me, the three main features of private equity as a business model, and those that distinguish it from other types of investment activities, are these. First, private equity firms raise funds to take control or significant minority stakes in the equity of companies that are not publicly traded. Okay? Second... Private equity firms are investing other people's money, predominantly other people's money, which means they're professional investors and they're almost always regulated. And third, they buy companies with a view to resale. They have an intention to sell their investments within a defined period of time, usually between three and seven years. And I'll come back to why that is in a moment. So, to summarise, equity investors in unlisted companies investing other people's money with a view to resale in around five years on average. And private equity has become a very important part of the financial ecosystem, more important now than it's ever been in the past. According to industry statistics, private equity and venture capital firms invested 138 billion euros into nearly 9,000 European companies in 2021 an all-time record. There are annual fluctuations, of course, and I'm sure we'll see lower levels, activity, lower levels of activity in the 2022 data uh, when that becomes available in the next few months. But the industry uh, has been thriving, and, and the growth of the industry since the financial crisis has been quite remarkable, and investors seem to have an ever-increasing appetite to invest in the asset class. So the industry is important, increasingly important, in recent years. It's important to the many European and institutional investors that invest in European private equity funds, of course. And, and those investors are generally pension funds, insurance companies and the like. They're people managing our money. So good results for private equity firms mean good results for us, for the pension funds and insurance companies that matter to us. But private equity is also important to Europe's smaller, high growth, high potential companies. According to industry statistics, about 90% of private equity and venture capital investments are in SMEs, small and medium sized companies. Broadly, businesses that have less than 250 employees. About 90% about by number of investments, of, of, of those 9,000 investments are in those kinds of companies. These growth businesses, these small but growing companies, are vital for the European economy. They're the large companies of the future. 
and most will be accessing private equity both because they need financial help but also because they want other support to grow and deliver on their potential. So my question is, do private equity firms, do the decision makers in private equity firms have the right incentives to deliver the help that these companies need to secure their future growth and prosperity? In my work, I focused on the incentives of the decision makers. To me, incentives matter hugely. They're a very significant predictor of behavior and an understanding of the incentive structures is, for me, crucial to any serious discussion about corporate governance. Indeed, to any discussion about responsible investment, ESG, sustainability, corporate purpose, we have to understand what's driving the decisions of the key decision makers. And so discussion of those incentives is where my book begins. In the book, I outline in more detail what the structure of the industry implies about incentives. I won't spend too much time on that now, but I'll just say uh, a few words. I'll draw out what I think are the most important points about the way the structure of the industry affects the incentives of those who are making decisions. First, a private equity firm is locked into an investee company for a reasonably long period of time. Locked in, can't sell, for a reasonably long period of time. As I said, uh, their holding periods vary, but five to seven years is a good rule of thumb. Although they usually don't know who the buyer of the company will be, they know that they're going to sell at some point, and they know that it's quite likely to be a sale to a sophisticated buyer. Somebody who understands the sector that the company operates in and who has an opportunity to do extensive due diligence. In other words, somebody who has, a fair, has an opportunity to make a fairly accurate assessment of what the company is worth. And if they sell for a profit, the decision makers in the firm usually get a fairly significant share of the profit, so-called carried interest. During their ownership period, the private equity firm has significant influence over the strategy and operations of the company. In general, private equity firms do not run companies, but they do have significant influence over strategy and over significant uh, business decisions. Private equity firms are repeat players. They have to raise funds from institutional investors every three to four years. So their reputation with those investors, remember mostly institutional investors, pension funds, insurance companies and the like, their reputation with those investors matters hugely to them. And every individual investment matters as well because every individual investment that the fund makes is going to be a significant proportion of the fund. Funds usually make something like 10 investments, 10 to 15 investments. So every investment is significant as a proportion of the overall fund. Uh, and so it matters economically to the firm. And it matters a lot to the individuals associated with the deal. If you're the individual and working in the private equity firm and you led the deal, then it matters a lot how that deal turns out in terms of your personal uh, standing in the organization. So these incentives are quite different from those that you observe in asset managers more generally, from those managing funds that invest in liquid securities. And the structure of the industry means that, in general, private equity firms want to make the company they have invested in more valuable during the five years or so that they own it. It's pretty simple, right? The incentive to build more valuable companies arises because usually private equity firms make their money for their investors and for themselves if the companies they invest in increase in value during their ownership period. Of course, there are sometimes other ways to make money from investments. But the primary channel, the main driver of returns for private equity funds, is going to be buying a company for X and selling for 2X or 3X. And if they don't make money on a deal, if the deal fails, they don't only lose out on that deal, which as I say is significant, but it also drags down returns uh, for the investors in that fund, and therefore it's going to be harder for them to raise another fund in two or three years' time. So these incentives are really powerful. Okay? They're really high-powered financial incentives to make the companies that they own more valuable during their ownership period so that they can sell them to sophisticated buyers at the end of that period. Uh, private equity firms don't only have these incentives, crucially, they also have the expertise and the influence to do it. 
private equity firms are highly sophisticated investors. They sit on the board, they understand the sector, they're involved in strategy. They're well placed, in fact, to assess both the short-term industry dynamics and the longer-term societal and regulatory trends that will affect the value of the businesses they acquire. They understand what's going to drive value creation. And they have the influence as members of the board of directors, as significant shareholders, to make sure that the management team focus on and deliver on, on, a, on an agreed strategy. Uh, private equity firms work hard before they invest to understand the drivers of success in the businesses they invest in. They do extensive due diligence. They have business plans. Um, they have 90-day plans to put into effect immediately after the deal's done. They're, they're well-informed shareholders, considerable experience of the sectors and the geographies they invest. That is, in fact, the core of their business model. So they have the incentives to make businesses more successful, and they have uh, the influence, the information, and the skills to do it. So far, so good. But some people worry a lot about the length of this ownership period. Okay? They think that private equity firms are short-term in their approach to value creation because we know that they are temporary owners of businesses. They will sell in some three, four, five, six, seven years' time. That, that, actually part, that is actually part of their model. The, the, the requirement to sell is usually demanded by the structure of the funds they raise. Their underlying investments are illiquid. Okay? So investors in those funds demand liquidity at some point in the future. And so private equity firms generally raise self-liquidating funds, funds that only make a single stream of investments and then return capital once the investments are sold. Um, that, that then gives the investors some confidence that they'll have liquidity at some point in the future during the defined life of the fund. So it's built into the model that private equity firms have to sell within a, a defined period. So does that make them short-term investors? Well, I leave it to you to decide whether three to seven years is a short period of time. On average, um, uh, as I say, it's about five years. And that's an ownership period which is almost always long enough to affect some change in the business, either to execute a buy and build strategy, to expand into new product lines or new markets, to cut costs and increase productivity, if that's the strategy. So whatever the plan is for the business, usually there's enough time to execute it during that ownership period. But actually, I would argue that the length of the holding period is, that, is not really the issue at all here. What matters is not when the private equity firm is planning to sell, but what its incentives are during its ownership period and how it will maximise returns when it does sell. Most of the time, as I've already said, private equity firms expect to sell a business to a well-informed buyer. Sometimes they IPO the business, float it on the public markets, but most often they sell to a trade buyer or another private equity firm, highly sophisticated buyers uh, who have an opportunity to do extensive due diligence. That buyer, in deciding how much to pay for the business, is going to be assessing the future, future potential of the business, the next five to ten years or even longer. So, so they're going to look at what happened to the business while it was owned by a private equity firm, but they don't care what happened then. What they really care about is whether what happened then is going to make the business fit for the next five to ten years, to make them money whilst they are the owner. So to maximise financial outcomes, a private equity firm has to position the business and tool it up so that a smart buyer will think it's a valuable asset with the potential to do well for many more years. Far from giving them an incentive to underinvest and strip out assets, the most likely incentive for a private equity firm is going to be to invest in and grow the business, what you might call an incentive to focus on long-term shareholder value. And that phrase shareholder value is important, and I'm going to come back to it and what it means for non-shareholders in a moment. But for now, my point is that the shareholder, the private equity firm, will do best when the company becomes more valuable and is more valuable to somebody who wants to own the business for the next five or ten years. And that's indeed what academics have most often seen. Of course it's not universal, and there are counterexamples, many counterexamples, but in general the academic evidence tells us that private equity companies see productivity gains and they seek out profitable growth opportunities. 
But you might say, well, trying to make companies more productive and more profitable, even if that's what private equity firms do, because that's what they're incentivized to do, well, that's not unique to private equity, right? Lots of business owners try to do that. So how does private equity do it, and is there something distinctive about what private equity is doing that makes it somehow better at that than other types of owner? Well, in my book, I look at the corporate governance mechanisms in private equity-backed companies, and I observe um, that what we see uh, is, to my mind, a key driver of this value creation process. I need to be clear about my definition of corporate governance, perhaps. So for me, corporate governance is the allocation of decision-making power and the decision-making processes embedded in a company's constitutional documents and operated in practice. In other words, it's the way in which decisions are taken, decisions about opportunity, decisions about risk. So for me, corporate governance is not a compliance issue, or at least it's not only a compliance issue, it's about effective decision-making processes. Okay? So what corporate governance do we observe in UK private equity-backed companies? My research focused on UK companies, and I studied 50 of them in my PhD research. So what did I observe? Well, first, the board of directors is really important for a private equity-backed company. It's a real focus for decision-making. And that might seem somehow surprising because boards of directors in public company contexts are usually thought of as being there to oversee management teams on behalf of the remote shareholders. And we don't necessarily have that same issue in the private equity industry. But actually, as well as providing oversight of the executive team, these boards of directors are also crucial decision-making forums that take real strategic and significant operational decisions in a sort of spirit of partnership between the private equity firm's representatives on the one hand and the executive team on the other. The private equity firm nominates some of these board members, sometimes but not always the majority of the board members, and these nominated directors, like the executive directors, are highly incentivized and focused on the same goal, the maximization of the, of the value of the business at the point of exit. The average, side of the board, average size of this board of directors in my sample was 6.7. Um, five to seven board members was usually regarded as being optimal by private equity executives that I spoke to. And um, they said that this was enough uh, to have all key decision makers and enough information around the table to make good, well-informed decisions, but not so many people that decision making becomes unmanageable. And that was the objective in bringing this board of directors together. So it's not so much an oversight forum as a decision-making uh, forum, a, a way in which better decisions, better informed decisions could be taken by a wider group of people than just the executive team. And the formality to that process was also important. So there were usually scheduled monthly board meetings which were regarded as important events in the life of the company, which is obviously not true for many, for most perhaps, private Companies. It might be true for public companies, but it's not true uh, for most private companies. And, and these scheduled board meetings um, were, were supplemented by lots more kind of ad hoc meetings um, outside of the, the normal schedule. Uh, many private equity firms ask the board to focus on risk and business integrity issues as well as uh, exploitation of proper um, strategic opportunities, profitable growth opportunities. And in my sample, 75% of these companies had an outside chair, someone who brought additional expertise, additional networks, and so on. And that external chair was regarded as very important by the private equity firms that used that mechanism. Uh, someone, they said, who added valuable resource to the decision-making process and added additional discipline to the decision-making process, all to help with the value creation process. So these corporate governance mechanisms, I argue in the book, and I describe them in a lot more detail there, are um, an important part of the way in which private equity firms uh, partner with management teams to make better decisions, better informed decisions, uh, and, and as well as making sure that the management team are implementing the agreed plan and sticking to uh, uh, looking, looking after, uh, sticking to uh, pursuing the agreed goals. Okay, so let's assume private equity firms are good at and highly incentivized to build more successful companies, more profitable, more valuable companies. They do that through effective uh, corporate governance mechanisms, better decision-making structures, or at least good decision-making structures. Uh, 
uh, to do that. But what does this mean for everyone else? Okay, so even if we accept everything I've said, that doesn't answer our question about what that means for society at large and whether society at large should have concerns about this uh, highly powered, high, high powered incentive to build more successful, more valuable uh, businesses. Well, to some extent, of course, more successful companies are good for all of us. Okay, that's just something um, that's, uh, that, that, that's sometimes true. To some extent, um, more successful companies are better for the company's employees, they're better for um, the company's customers, their suppliers, what we usually call stakeholders, benefit from successful companies in very general terms. Um, if the company grows, it probably employs more people, it might provide better job security, it might, um, it might have an expanded product range, which is good for customers, and, and might have more financial security, which is better for suppliers, and so on and so on and so on. But we know that things are a lot more complicated than that, right? We, we know that more successful companies aren't always good for uh, these wider non-shareholder uh, constituencies. Uh, businesses, large and small, have all sorts of impacts on non-shareholder constituencies, what economists call externalities. And when those impacts are negative, when they're negative externalities, we rightly worry whether the governance and ownership model of certain types of business encourage or exacerbate the creation of those negative externalities. And we're right to worry about that. Um, and a focus on these uh, wider societal effects is, of course, very topical at the moment. The buzzwords ESG and sustainability are now everywhere in the financial world. And the question of how companies affect people and how they affect planet is a critical one. The creation of more purposeful companies, those that take account of their external negative impact, is a laudable policy objective and the subject of significant academic and business discussion. So what can we say about whether the incentives of private equity firms make it more or less likely that the private equity-backed companies they control will create externalities? Well, first, in order to realise the best financial return on their investment in a business, as I've already said, a private equity firm must have confidence that the business will be attractive to a buyer at the time at which it wants to sell. It therefore, the private equity firm therefore, the strategy of the business therefore, has to anticipate the environment into which it will be selling in the future. It has to be ahead of the longer term trends that will determine the value of the firm. It must react early in its holding period to those trends so that it can make changes that will make the business more valuable to a buyer in the future. So, if environmental and social issues are relevant to long-term value, because the regulatory environment is evolving, because stakeholder preferences are shifting, we would certainly expect a private equity firm to be focused on those issues and to be reactive to them. In a recent book, Alex Edmonds, a professor at the London Business School, argues persuasively that businesses that are driven by purpose, in other words, where the objective is social value rather than profit, those businesses, Professor Edmonds says, are consistently more successful in the long term. His book is called Grow the Pie, and he provides many examples of how by focusing on and creating social value, companies can also make more money for shareholders. So if Professor Edmonds is right, a rational private equity firm would certainly focus on corporate purpose. Okay? If corporate purpose is going to make the company more valuable, then a rational private equity firm is going to focus on corporate purpose. Personally, I think Professor Edmonds is increasingly right. Shareholder concerns, environmental regulation, customer preferences, employee retention rates, access to a diverse talent pool, I think these things increasingly are affecting how successful a business is in the long term, and therefore are affecting, and increasingly will affect, how much a buyer is willing to pay for that business in the future. Anecdotal evidence already suggests that private equity firms focus on that, and they certainly say that they focus on that. So perhaps we might come back to this in our discussion, because I'm really interested in Sarah and Peter's views on this, and yours of course, but there is mounting evidence that businesses that treat employees well are more productive and therefore more valuable. Businesses that give their customers the products they want, and increasingly those customers want uh, products that are sourced in a, in a sustainable and responsible way, those businesses will sell more stuff at higher prices and they'll be more valuable. Businesses 
that can transition away from a carbon intensive business model, they'll be more valuable in three, four, five years time. Businesses that use less packaging and so on. And remember, if a private equity firm buys a business today, they're not concerned about whether these things affect the value of the business today. To have a, an incentive to respond to these changing drivers of value, they need to think about what, whether those things will affect value in five years' time. What matters changes over time. This is what people are calling dynamic materiality. The idea that materiality, of financial materiality, what matters to outcomes in a business, is changing. And it certainly is. So to, create an to have an incentive to create more sustainable businesses that generate fewer externalities, that embrace purpose, only requires that the private equity firm, that the board of the company, thinks those things will matter to the value of the business when it's time to sell. They have an incentive to get ahead of those value drivers so that when they do sell, their business stands out from its competitors. If the decision makers in private equity firms are smart, and take it from me, they are, they will take account of these evolving value drivers when taking strategic or operational decisions or taking part in those decisions in relation to the company. And if policymakers, if regulators, can find more ways to force businesses, all businesses, to internalise, to pay for their negative externalities, we would certainly expect an effective long-term shareholder value strategy to minimise those externalities. If politicians tax carbon or fine companies that don't mitigate human rights abuses, as the EU says it's about to do, we'd expect the decision makers in private equity-backed companies to respond. It would help if governments could make clear and credible commitments to the future direction of policy too, because remember, what matters is what the policy environment is going to look like in three, four, five years' time. And the more that customers care, the more employees care about the behaviour of the companies they work for or the companies they buy from, the more these things are going to affect shareholder value. And I think private equity investors have the expertise to recognise when these things are important to value and they have supercharged incentives to respond to them. But what if I'm wrong about that? What if, what if these issues don't affect a company's value now or in five years' time? And in any case, it seems clear that all environmental and social issues will not, not all environmental and social issues will be financially material to a business, not to every business. Some businesses will be more sensitive to certain issues than to others. Some issues may be not material to the future value of a particular kind of business in a particular part of the world at a particular time. In that case, do we think that private equity companies, private equity backed companies will ignore those externalities. In fact, would they have supercharged incentives to create negative externalities? Because they're not paying for, those, for, for, for the impact of those, but they are getting the value or the benefit from them. Well, perhaps, but I think at this point we have to think about another incentive mechanism that's operating on private equity firms. The principals in a private equity firm have other incentives that sit alongside this incentive to create shareholder value in their investee companies. One such incentive, perhaps the most powerful, arises from the fact that private equity is not in fact private. Private equity firms are publicly associated with what happens in an underlying business. If a portfolio company behaves irresponsibly, it breaches laws or societal norms, the private equity firm will be associated with that behaviour, probably in the press, but in any event, certainly with the investors that have invested in the fund, because they know exactly which companies the private equity funds have invested in. So why should the private equity firm care about that? They're publicly associated, um, and certainly associated in the minds of their investors with these, with these companies that don't behave responsibly. Well, the private equity firm will have an incentive to ensure that businesses do the right thing, that they behave ethically and responsibly, whether or not it's in the company's own financial interests, if its own stakeholders care, if the stakeholders of the private equity fund care. Its employees, its own employees, its own immediate stakeholders, most crucially, its own investors. Because they're the people that drive the value of the private equity firm. Remember, every three years you have to go back and raise a new private equity fund, 
So you need those stakeholders, those crucial investors, to be supportive of the business. And uh, this incentive to drive responsible behaviour in private equity firms is actually really interesting to me because it increases, as other people, sp specifically the institutions that typically invest in private equity funds, it increases the more they prioritise responsible investment. So the more an investor, a pension fund, uh, cares, the more the private equity firm should care, even if that's a, an ESG issue that has no direct impact on the value of the business, the underlying business concern. If it does have an impact on the value of the business, remember, we've certainly got an incentive to respond to it. But even if it doesn't, if my investors care, then I should care. And that's because of the accountability mechanism that's built into the private equity firm's relationship with its own investors. It's a very close uh, relationship and, as I say, relies upon uh, periodic fundraising as well as almost continuous communication. Emerging regulations, especially here in Europe, are continuing to encourage a greater focus on sustainability for regulated investors. And a private equity investor that wants to, a private equity firm that wants to raise money from those investors has no choice but when it goes fundraising to demonstrate its ESG credentials. That's, a, that's now a fact of life. If a pension fund in the Netherlands or in California does due diligence on a private equity fund before it invests, and it does, and if it cares about climate change or about diversity and inclusion, and increasingly it does, then they're going to ask some searching questions of the private equity firm. And private equity fund managers had better have good answers to those uh, questions. Because not raising a fund or raising a smaller fund or taking longer to raise a fund has a real cost for the private equity firm, a real financial cost. They don't want to please their investors because they're nice people, although some of them are nice people. Uh, they want to please their investors uh, because it's in their financial interest to do so, because they have powerful incentives to do so. Now, of course, there's going to be some greenwashing, inevitably, right? Firms will present their credentials in the best possible light. Who doesn't, right? But as reporting becomes more sophisticated and standardised, very much the theme of EU and UK interventions in non-financial reporting, uh, and as investors employ more specialist resource to perform due diligence on funds, the scope to hide irresponsible or unethical behaviours reduces, and the willingness of these investors to turn a blind eye to it uh, correspondingly reduces. So the structure of the industry, which requires regular fundraising, facilitates detailed investor due diligence, bespoke negotiation of investment documentation, makes it very hard for most private equity firms, even very successful private equity firms, to ignore the evolving preferences of their own investment investor base. So one of the arguments that I make in my book is that while we would expect all commercial companies to be responsive to changes that affect the long-term value of their business, there are reasons to think that private equity firms are going to be super responsive to them. And in fact, even legal, regulatory and societal changes that have no impact on the financial value of the business per se might also be expected to affect behaviour in a private equity-backed company if, for regulatory or other reasons, the ultimate investors in the fund care about them. So, to end where I began, if we think, I think, that we will make most progress in changing the world for the better if we focus on the incentives of decision makers, and when those incentives incentivise things that are bad for society, we work to change those incentives. Personally, I don't think it's very helpful to think about company law change or changes to directors' duties or to impose corporate governance frameworks uh, on businesses if they don't align with the incentives of the decision makers because in that case they're unlikely to make any real difference. What makes a difference is incentives. Incentives are changing. I think the focus of society and of politicians who respond to what society wants are focused more on sustainability, on more responsible behaviour. And this is causing, slowly but surely, the incentives of business decision makers to change. I expect private equity firms to respond to those changes, to respond early to those changes, and to respond effectively because of the way they make their money, because of their strong focus on corporate governance, because of their focus on sound decision making and management accountability. And indeed, that is the response that I'm seeing from the firms I'm working with in my practice at the moment. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to our discussion.
Simon, awful lot there to provoke thought. So over to Peter. <laughs> Thank you. That, that's just what I was about to say. Actually, there's a lot of food for thought and a lot to try to kind of respond to. So. I mean, firstly, thanks for both for, for having me. Um, I'm not an academic or a lawyer, uh, so being asked to speak here at, a, at an academic institution by a lawyer is kind of the first for me. But what I do have uh, that I can perhaps kind of impart some of the things I'm seeing, because pretty much on a daily basis, myself and my team at the PRI are interacting with these GP, sorry, and if I slip into private equity speak, the GPs are the investment managers and the LPs are the asset owners and the pension funds. So we're, we're speaking pretty much every day with either GPs or LPs. Um, so I, I, you know, what I'm going to say is, is informed by that experience rather than any kind of legal or academic uh, background. But firstly, I, I generally agree with pretty much you know, most of the things there that, that Simon said has said around incentives and the governance structure of, of private equity and you know what it has the, the potential to do and achieve. But I but I think um, I think the question for me is is really how far along the line it, it has got there. Um, so just, just just quickly before I go on, because uh, the PR, so I work for the PRI. A lot of people in the financial industry kind of know automatically who, who the PRI is. But just for all of you, it's a uh, it's a it's a uh, non-profit organisation that's backed by the United Nations and kind of came out of the UN in, in 2005 or 2006, I think. But we're basically a proponent of responsible investment. So so clearly some of the things they're going to say. Uh, with that, that in mind, and we've got around 5,000 signatories now. They're all investment managers or asset owners, like the, the pension funds and the private equity firms. Uh, and, and somebody said to me the other day, I, I can't kind of vouch for the correctness of this, but the assets under management of those 5,000 are around about half of the uh, globally institutionally managed assets that are out there. And we, within those 5,000 signatories, we have a, around about 1,000 private equity and venture capital signatories now, which is up from about 500 uh, probably three years ago. So you can see if, if that's any kind of proxy of the interest in responsible investment and ESG within the PE and VC industry, that, that's quite a good indicator, I think, of the, of the interest. And that, that's, that's driven by a few things, including, uh, you know, as Simon was saying, the, the, the increasing interest in that by in responsible investment from the LPs, the asset owners. So they're, they're kind of compelling their, uh, the, the, the firms they invest in as clients to, to, to come and join us. But I think, I think coming back to the LP demand, the, in, the interest, that, that is an interesting driver of responsible investment here. And some of the sophisticated LPs are, are doing you know, quite a lot of work to understand the way the uh, private equity firms integrate ESG into their investment process, their strategy, their decision making, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're ranking, they're scoring GPs, um, but there are still parts, you know, Simon mentioned the California pension funds, the, the, the Dutch pension funds, but there are still quite large parts, I think, of the, of the, uh, the asset owner universe in private equity that, that care less about these things. Uh, some of the sovereign wealth funds, for example, spring, spring to mind. So, there is definitely pressure coming from the asset owners for the private equity firms to, to, to change, but, but I do kind of question how much, and I'll, I'll kind of say a few more things about that, that in a moment. Um, the client pressure aside, I, I, I also believe that private equity has, actually has quite a crucial role to play here. And when we talk about ESG and responsible investment, I'll, I'll kind of boil it down to one of the main topics that uh, kind of makes up what is actually a really kind of varied, um, wide-ranging array of topics, really. Everything from diversity, equity, inclusion, to biodiversity, to um, you know, health and safety. But, but if we think about climate, um, you know, I, I really think private equity has a big role to play in helping many companies decarbonize or get on the track to decarbonizing, for example. They can't do everything uh, that they would like, you know, in the five to six year average holding period, for example, but they can, 
do this work with with companies, uh, give, given the model of you know being control investors, taking seats on the board, and having you know that that much more sort of bigger operational influence over the companies in which they invest. And I was going to compare this to the public markets, but I can't say anything too disparaging because I've just seen one of my colleagues who's responsible for public markets is is in the room. But that, but that compares quite dramatically, I think, with public markets where you've got such a a much broader investor base in every company and you know if those investors want to take action against any or, or try to engage with companies and try to affect change then it's a much more difficult job so I, I personally think private markets have got a big role to, to play here and particularly in the middle market as well Simon mentioned you know was it 90 percent of uh, investments in the UK are in mid, mid market companies and and, and that's where some of the difficulty comes, I, I think, as well, and where the private, the, the kind of the expertise of the private equity firms is actually needed, because most of the time, when a GP invests in a in a mid-market company, and until they kind of they they come under private equity ownership, and, and think, I'm thinking about climate again here, a lot of the management teams and the boards don't necessarily either have the expertise or. They, they just haven't really kind of got to grips with the whole issue around climate risk, uh, the way regulation and policy might change in the future, or even measure, starting to measure their carbon emissions. So most of the companies that private equity invests in, when they invest, don't even measure carbon emissions. So the GPs have quite a bit of work to do guiding those management teams, upskilling them, introducing them to experts for, from elsewhere to, to set them on this, this kind of journey into uh, uh, of decarbonisation. So, so there's lots to do. And, and actually, I've, uh, one of the statistics I found earlier, that there was a survey by PwC uh, quite recently, um, a, a board survey, and, and only 27% of boards uh, on com of companies at less than a billion dollar market cap, I think it was, actually discussed climate change. So, so there's clearly a lot that those PE firms that care about this ca can do. Um, but having said that, you know, when, when I said we have a thousand private equity and VC firms as signatories, that doesn't mean a thousand private equity firms and VC firms are fantastic at doing this. That, that it's a very uh, kind of diverse array uh, of, of degrees of sophistication or degrees of intent as, as to where the, these firms are at. At the, the kind of top end of, of, of the spectrum, there are, there are some firms doing some great work. Still, you know, there, there are those that are yet to uh, really get started and, and, and catch up. Um, I think, as well, you know, re resourcing is a bit of an issue, especially at some of the smaller firms. So I'm speaking about climate here, or focusing on climate a little bit, but we're asking them to, to focus on all sorts of kind of non-traditional, non-financial issues that have not traditionally been associated in, with, with the, the role of finance. And even trying to address climate change and climate risk is actually quite a big job. So when we speak to them about things like biodiversity, um, Diversity, equity, inclusion to an extent in certain regions in the, in the US is probably the number one topic. You know, there, there's this real issue of, of how the, those firms go about resourcing it. But again, I guess if their asset owners and their clients were, were to make it an even higher priority, then they would divert the resources to do that. But I, 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 I do question the, the ability and the leverage of the LPs and the asset owners to really influence the, the GPs at, at this stage. I think, I think it's certainly one of the factors affecting them and, and think getting them to think more about ESG and sustainability, along with uh, simple kind of finance and economics. It, it, in many cases, it makes you know, financial and economic sense to, uh, you know, as Simon was saying, think about these things because your next buyer, whether it's a PE firm or a strategic or a multinational or whoever, uh, are increasingly thinking about it and they'll obviously kind of discount cash flows potentially out to perpetuity. So buyers are, are potentially going to pay higher multiples. But on the on the asset owner side, I think what we have to realise is that they don't necessarily have the teeth at the moment to, to really force that change. 
most PE funds are closed-ended, uh, particularly in VC, they can be quite small. Uh, and again, in VC, they're also very high-performing funds. So the opportunity cost for all those investors to either make themselves see particularly difficult over these kind of issues, or you know, really sort of stick their heads above the parapet, that, that there is a genuine opportunity cost there, um, whereby they may not even get an allocation to certain funds. I mean, anecdotally, we've heard in, in the VC world of state pension funds in the US questioning issues around ESG during the fundraise and then finding out about subsequent fundraisers that are in the press after they've closed. So there's kind of a, a general sort of fear out there um, from some of the LPs. So again, that, and, and the LPs do care about their reputation too, I, I, I think, and the, the GPs increasingly so. But um, yeah, I, I guess I just question the, 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 the appetite for change or, or the ability to, to kind of for the investors to force that change. And you know, when we think about reputation in particular, and we were having a discussion sort of beforehand around Boohoo, and we both, we'd all had slightly different experiences of consumers of, of Boohoo's products and how likely they are to really change consumer patterns and things after after reputational issues like like Boohoo had, uh, and how and just how sticky that, that that those reputational risks are. But I think you know, um, GPs have got in increasingly more to concern themselves with, I think, over reputation. And there are, there, there, there are initiatives out there and organisations out there that, that are kind of making it their business to pretty much document every perceived um, ill that private equity or private and private equity firms have ever got themselves in, in, involved in. And, and uh, so th th those risks are, are raising. Um, Increasing. We even had protests actually at a conference uh, last year from fossil fuel protesters. Um, so, so GPs do need to, to think about that. But I, but just quickly, uh, I won't take too too much longer. But go, going back to what you were saying about the uh, sort of financial performance, and, and I, I really do think that is still critical. I was with a consultant last week who. You kind of said, well, aren't we past that stage? You know, don't, don't we just know that these things are good for business? They, they create value. And I, I'm not quite sure we're, we're there. I, you know, we talk about academic evidence in, in private equity. And sometimes just given the nature of private equity and the lack of data and the, the real kind of difficulty in assessing what's going on. And I think, you know, to, to me, even in terms of private equity returns, we're still, you know, depending on which, which, which academic you might speak with, we're, we're still even struggling to, to prove beyond doubt, for example, that median PE returns outperform returns of public markets, net, net of fees and costs. So I think it's really quite difficult to, to put a value on the, the, the things that private, the private equity firms are doing when it comes to, to ESG, and I think that needs some more work. And it's, it's, it's clear that people really still need to buy into that to be able to believe that this is value creative and not a box ticking exercise and, and to kind of do, do that work. And going back to the PwC survey again, quite, I, I was kind of, maybe I shouldn't have been surprised, I don't know, but apparently only 45% of directors at companies that are valued at below that $1 billion market cap threshold, again, believe that ESG factors do actually affect the bottom line. So there's clearly some kind of some, some work for, for everyone involved to, to, to do there. Um, and then just, just to wrap up, I suppose on you know your, your call around um, you know regulating behaviours internally, in, internalising externalities and things, you know, where where there's damage being done to planet or people. I think I think the key word there has to be it is good and good good regulation. I mean you're you're a lot more qualified than I am to opine on whether, you know, what we've seen to date has, has been great and really achieved its in, intended goals. I would argue there's a lot of work to be, to be done there uh, too. But also, if we're going to rely on regulation, how do we regulate for what are actually some quite complex issues? If you, and one of the things here I was thinking today is like diversity, equity and inclusion. So, Obviously, we're, we're encouraging 
more diversity, equity, diversity, not just because of the sort of the, the social imperative side of things, but also the academic evidence that points to more diversity being a good thing for for, for uh, returns and, and the performance of companies. But you know, when when you think about that, it's not necessarily the visible kind of attributes of diversity that are driving that. It, it's more about the um, trying to avoid groupthink. So it can also include things like social economic backgrounds, neurodiversity of the people working at your firms, etc. So how how do you you know get get into a world where you're trying to regulate that? We need the we need GPs and we need private equity firms to, to try to think beyond regulation, I I think. Not just to get in front of the curve to for when extra regulation does come their way, but to do these things that should be good for business but aren't necessarily regulated, especially in, in regions where there is little regulation, perhaps. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, and this is one of the big things PRI is working on, is, is policy. And uh, we've got a big policy team that engages with governments and regulators ar around the world. And, th and they're tracking policy tools and, and guidance from those regulators and other markets. And, and they're up to 868. Uh, separate kind of pieces of policy and guidance and stuff now that that's being uh, that's kind of being developed and in the pipeline out there. So regulation is coming. I, I, I guess I just question, you know, what what does good look like, and, and how do we make sure it does the the, the, the intended job? Um, but yeah, look, I'll, I'll stop there. The I, I, I suppose I, I can probably afford to be a bit bit more um, controversial, perhaps, and maybe we can. I think, you know, Simon, you, you were speaking about some of the initiatives that are out there and the, the work, the interesting stuff being done around employee ownership, for example. And, and there is some good and interesting stuff, but I question pretty much on a daily basis, you know, is, is this, are these all genuine attempts by the PE industry to do what they think is value creative and, and the right thing, or is it kind of a bit of, uh, okay, I'm going to do some great stuff on one hand in order to deflect from some of the other things I might be doing on, on, on another hand. Well, that does seem like an excellent hook to leave things on. So let's just thank Peter. <laughs> now, before I open up to the floor for questions, I feel I have to give Simon a, a couple of moments for a, a right of reply. I mean, I, I violently agree with... Uh, with, with, with Peter, I, I think that, um, as, as, I, as I tried to argue in the book and, and just now, I mean, private equity firms respond to the incentives that are in front of them, and good regulation, which changes incentives, so carbon tax or effective regulation and finding of human rights abuses in supply chains, I, I think that's going to, will, should change incentives. I agree with you, getting those regulations right is not straightforward, but we can all help, right? We can, we can and should uh, help regulators to understand how they can regulate most effectively. Um, you know, changing consumer preferences, changing employee preferences. These are all really important drivers, but they only are drivers if they're real, right? Um, and so, you know, and, and, you know, incentives from LPs are only incentives if the, GP, if the LPs really mean it, if they're just not just saying it because they think it sounds good, but if they're transmitting, um, you know, their genuinely held belief that this is something that, 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 that needs to be uh, addressed, if, if, if they're transmitting that effectively to the GP, and I agree with you that there are sometimes failures in that mechanism um, that mean it doesn't quite work and we have to look at ways to make that happen more effectively so LP voice is held more clearly in, in, in GP firms. So I agree with you that you know, there are problems with making those incentives to behave more responsibly really effective. Uh, I think you know, we've all got a role in, and that's part of what you're doing, right? It's a big part of your job in, in, in shining a light on that and <coughs> making those incentives even more real. I think they're becoming real. I see it in my practice, private equity firms increasingly focusing on this, all businesses increasingly focusing on, on, on this because it is, I think, genuinely changing, but maybe it's changing too slowly, maybe um, 
you know, m m maybe it could change more quickly if, um, if, if, if regulators were better at finding ways to signal a clear direction of travel and implement, as you say, good and effective regulation. Look, it is definitely changing. Um, the, the pace, you know, we, you, you can debate the pace and you know, whether it's changing fast enough. Um, and just going back to the LPs, you know, I, I don't want to give the impression that the LPs don't care. They, they definitely do, especially those that are kind of universal asset owners, we would say. They, they care deeply about some of these, what they see as excuse me, systemic risks like, like climate change. So. They do care. I, I think it's then that the, uh, the the mechanism of like how they actually get the, the GPs to care as well need need some need some work definitely. Um, the and, and just mention the carbon. You mentioned carbon tax actually. That that reminded me to mention something. Is that yes, perhaps you know regulation around carbon tax. It, you know, it, perhaps it's coming. Perhaps it will be effective. You, Probably, I mean, I'm kind of diverging into realms I don't know, probably know enough to be dangerous about, but not quite enough. You know, presumably that needs to be on a global basis and you, you need to avoid uh, kind of leakage like in, in tax regulation and things. But some of the GPs are, themselves are getting in front of that already and they're, they're imposing internal carbon taxes uh, or, you know, costs of carbon on the, the investments that they make. So, you know, they'll, they'll look at a an investment during due diligence, um, that they'll always be you know, thinking about exit before they've even made the investment. Mm. And in this case, they're kind of presenting different scenarios. So they'll say, okay, what does our exit multiple look like if we don't do any work around decarbonisation and we don't switch to renewables and we et cetera, et cetera. And they're trying to kind of make the case to deal teams that you know your exit multiple may be lower if you don't do this kind of stuff. But then you know, there are potential unintended consequences of doing that. Do you drive investment committees and, and PE firms away from assets that are kind of high emitters, for example, but could actually be transformed into greener companies with PE ownership? And I think PE kind of needs to go where the emissions are to an extent because it can change those companies. I'm anxious to give everyone a chance to, to raise questions. I should say, I should have said at the outset that the session is being recorded. Um, so just bear that in mind in answering questions, in asking questions. I have plenty of my own, but I'm not going to abuse Chair's privilege. I'll, I'll take questions from the floor first. So do we have any questions? Uh, we have two microphones and only one of me. So I'll, I'll try and do this in as... as in a streamlined way as I can. There we go. Hello. Um, I work in PR and comms for uh, a number of private equity firms. And I was interested in Professor Whitney's uh, one, uh, one aspect of your, your speech where you talked about carried interest. <laughs> and we see in, in, in some of the, the UK press the, 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 the question around whether carried interest is in fact viable, whether it should actually exist, the profits that the private equity companies make and, and, and the tax benefits that come associated with carried interest. Tying into what the PRI is trying to do with engaging with private equity companies, do you think that carried interest is a, is, is a necessary factor in order to get private equity companies to engage? Um, or like some journalists, might suggest, do you think that it should be done away with um, and that we should, we should sort of democratise private equity in a way? Do we have the, the, the demands of the LPs and, and the stakeholders, are they enough to incentivise the private equity companies to continue to do a good job or is carried interest an integral part of, of making sure that the private equity companies do? Thank you for the question. Um, so. Carried interest, which, as most people in the room, but perhaps not everybody will know, is, uh, uh, is one of the ways in which private equity firms tend to be remunerated. It's a share of the profits, uh, broadly speaking, a share of the profits on the investments when those investments are sold. 
and typically it's 20% of the profits, not always, but typically 20%. And the students in my class will know, because we've been discussing it over the last couple of weeks, that um, carried interest is pretty good, not perfect, but pretty good at aligning the incentives of the general partner with the investors. It's a, it's, it's a mechanism which means that private equity firms only get paid that significant uh, 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 performance-related fee, performance-related incentive as profit share if and when the investors make money. So it's a way to make sure that private equity firms are focused on achieving that exit. They don't get anything, they don't get any performance-related incentive when they do a deal, they only get an incentive when they realize a deal, which is the moment at which investors reap their return. And so it's a, it's a mechanism which is widely regarded as being one that helps to focus the minds of private equity firms on achieving what their investors want, which is more valuable businesses when the private equity firm sells. And more money for investors means more money for carried interest holders. And as I say, there's a big debate to be had, and, and, and we've had some of it in our classes around uh, the extent to which that is a genuine alignment of interest, but on the whole, my belief is that it does a, a, a align interests. So if we buy my argument, which is that increasingly, um, it, increasingly social, societal and environmental issues affect the value of businesses, then in a way, carried interest is one of the transmission mechanisms for forcing GPs to focus on those issues. They, they get paid more carried interest if the business they sell is more valuable, if environmental and social issues are affecting the value of a business, then the carried interest is one of the ways in which private equity firms are incentivized to focus on environmental and social issues. If, if conversely, environmental and social issues make no difference to the value of a business, then um, and carried interest certainly doesn't incentivize a focus on those societal issues. So I, I don't think carried interest should be done away with. I think carried interest is a very positive thing. It's a way to align interest between investors and LPs, um, sorry, investors and GPs. But, um, but to the extent to which it's good for society at large really depends on the discussion we're having around whether or not better, more responsible businesses, more purposeful businesses, um, businesses that seek to grow the pie in, in, in Professor Edmonds' terms, whether, whether they're more valuable businesses or, or, or not. Can I? Yeah, of course. Very quickly. I mean, carried, carried, when you speak to people in the industry, carried interest and then tax are like two big hot button issues. And when you combine both of them, it kind of turns into a big flashing red light, I think. We, we haven't done any work on it as yet, but I think there's definitely... I, I think, gen, you know, generally speaking, that, that's right. If we think ESG factors are, are financially material, then sure, why not reward, you know, in, improving those things in, in some way, like through carried interest. But, you know, I think there are some questions around, um, you know, like the tax status, for example. Um, and I don't think it's a simple kind of political answer around that either. You know, at the moment, that as a partner or you know principal in a PE firm, you, for example, could borrow the what we would call the GP stake. So, you know, the, the commitment that the team puts into a fund to help with alignment of interest, you could you know people can actually borrow that. So you're you're effectively not putting any any of your own capital or very little of your net worth at stake in that fund. So you know the question for me would be, okay, should it still be taxed at capital gains tax rates as opposed to income tax? And I know that's a massive kind of political issue, especially in the US, but um, yeah, some sensible conversation around that would probably be useful. Not, not here, but. Yeah, so I was going to say, I think uh, the, the bad news is you've now got to stay for a week while we, <laughs> while we investigate that particular topic. I think we had another question over here. just mention your affiliation at the beginning as well, that'd be great. Yes, uh, hello, my name is Elias. I'd like to ask um, in what ways the limited partners um, can exert a positive influence, uh, for, for example, from their participation in the advisory committees of the underlying uh, companies. Uh, 
and uh, how can ensure and the well necessary monitor that the fund is operating consistently with um, an agreed upon ESG related practices and policies? Thank you. That's a good question. Do you want to take another question or shall I answer that? Okay, of course. So uh, thank you for the good question. Um, I think that you've put your finger on an important issue, which is limited partners are somewhat remote from what's going on in the general partner and even more remote from what's going on in the underlying private equity backed companies. So they have some issues in understanding whether ESG issues are being taken care of, whether, um, whether commitments that are being made at the time that the funds are being raised are being lived in practice on the ground in the underlying companies. But I think what I'm seeing, I mean, first of all, we've got UNPRI, which is a good way for people to have, you know, have to report on um, their responsible investment practices if they're signatories uh, to, the, to the PRI framework. Um, but also, um, investors are getting much better. They're pretty good now, I'd say. Certainly a number of them are very good at re requiring reporting of, of meaningful, decision-useful data uh, from the GP about what's happening in the underlying portfolio. And regulation is helping with this in the EU. Um, regulation is kind of forcing increasing amounts of disclosure and uh, investors are getting better at understanding the information that they're given and working out what they want to do about that. As Peter said, in some circumstances, there might be a question about what they can do about it. You get some information, don't particularly like what you see, you engage with the general partner. My experience of that is that general partners are very responsive to understanding, as I said in my presentation, the evolving preferences of their investor base because they know that they're going to go and have to sit opposite them in a room in a few years' time and ask them to write another cheque. And they know, you know, and I, I take on board what. Peter said about you know, how the competitive dynamics of the private equity industry can sometimes make it difficult for LPs to ask awkward questions or, or, to make, or, or to make demands. But actually, in what I see is that they do make demands and they do, generally speaking, get what they're asking for. So I think you're, make, you're, you're pointing out an important issue, which is how LPs become informed about what's actually happening and how they take action in relation to it. What I'd say is that LPs have been working on this and regulation and the PRI and others have been helping them to get better at it and I think they are better at it. I think they're quite good at it now in, in, in many cases. There's definitely a lot more data coming out of you know, portfolio companies and its GPs and up to LPs. Um, and some of that is regulatory driven, some of it is because the LPs, you know, the, the LPs themselves have specific kind of data requests. Um, I, I suppose, look, I, I think you're right in that the, the, the GPs do kind of bow to those kind of requests. And uh, I suppose, I suppose in my mind, when, when I say the LPs don't have that much influence, it, it's more about over what they, you know, how the GPs then use that <coughs> information to either work on different kind of strategic projects within portfolio companies around sustainability to try to create value you know it's going that kind of step further other than just extracting data but, you know they, they, they go they, they've kind of got to the point where what's your phrase about what, what you can whatever you can measure you can manage they, they've definitely kind of getting to the measurement point but then going beyond that is a little more challenging another question here Hi, I'm Shakri, a PhD student um, with the law school. Um, it seems like a lot of the arguments presented, I think, on both sides are quite market-based. There's a sense that um, the biggest, the, the most straightforward way to get um, funds and portfolio companies to behave well is um, to stand by the argument that better-behaving companies generate better returns, um, have cheaper access to capital. Um, but assuming that doesn't hold. Um, or doesn't hold enough, such that there's a, a clamor for more substantive regulation. Um, could you see regulatory arbitrage uh, coming into the picture? And if so, how? I think, um, Simon, I think we'll just take a second question with an eye on the time. So um, you can take this question as well. Hi, Mark from 
Hi, my name is Ben. I went to LSE and graduated in 2021 and I work at a ESG consultancy working with sort of alternative managers on integrating ESG and responsible investment in their sort of investment processes. And I just have a question on sort of the UMPRI and how, Peter, I think you talked about asset owners who are less interested sort of in responsible investment and how that can create sort of misaligned incentives with uh, some of the GPs. I just wanted to know what your view is on the role of the PRI with engaging with such asset owners, as well as also private equity firms who may not be living up to all of the principles under the UN PRI. I cognizant that the PRI is a really broad church and does a lot of work to also help improve sort of processes and practices. Um, so I'll start with the question on regulation and regulatory arbitrage. So I, I personally think that good regulation, and that word good is important and doing a lot of work in that phrase, but good regulation uh, can really help here um, because I do think that there are certain societal preferences that don't transmit uh, particularly clearly or quickly into corporate behaviour. Um, and um, therefore, I do think it's important that regulators come up with ways to uh, identify their key priorities and then uh, work hard to regulate them effectively. The Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, the um, so-called CS3D, which EU regulators are working on at the moment, um, it's got a lot of problems. It's not perfect. Um, but personally, I think that that kind of regulatory intervention, which forces companies to think about, to understand, to work out what's happening in their own supply chains, to report on that and to mitigate where they can in accordance with kind of UN um, uh, principles, um, they try to mitigate the, the, the external impacts of their of, of, of what their supply chain is engaged. And I think that's potentially really quite helpful. But your point is, well, you know, yes, but aren't there ways to avoid regulation? Isn't there a regulatory arbitrage going on? And, and to some extent, unless we are all able to regulate in a global sense, if unless the whole world comes together and regulates, then to some extent, you know, yes. But the EU is a big market and it is regulating um, you know, for, for its own market and increasingly there are ways to figure out how to avoid that kind of regulatory arbitrage issue by, for example, having kind of border taxes so that you say, well, okay, you can't just shift your carbon emissions to another country. Once you import the product, then you pay a border tax in relation to the... So you can, can find ways, I think, and we have to be creative in looking for ways to avoid this, um, you know, the unintended effects of regulation, which is just to push activity elsewhere or give uh, people an opportunity to play one regulatory regime off against another. But you're right, it's a, you know, it's a real problem. It's not something that, that, that anybody's got a simple answer to. Um, but I don't think that should stop us trying to work out how good, well-targeted, effective regulation. And I keep just stressing lots of regulation, and Peter said it earlier, lots of regulation is not so regulation that we see at the moment is not good, effective, well-targeted regulation. And that's bad. That's counterproductive. That actually does more harm than good. Um, but calibrating regulation effectively and doing it well, I think, can be an important tool. Um, yeah, no, th thanks for the question. So, the, yeah, the, the, yes, the PRI is a broad church. Uh, so, you know, as I said earlier, we've got... The, Thousand or maybe twelve hundred PE or VC signatories, depending, you know, on how how you define it, and and certainly by by no means are they all, you know, particularly expert in doing a lot of the stuff that we try to compel them to do. But I think in in joining the BRI, that's kind of you know signalling some intent to to start working towards those things, and and. I don't, I, you know, I don't think we should necessarily be excluding them because they, they haven't sort of reached uh, that kind of degree of maturity yet. And I, I suppose it must be around ha half of the, the, those signatories, you know, there's 500 that have only joined within the last uh, three years. Uh, and many of those won't have reported yet. So, you know, th there's a lot of 
work to do, but I think they're better in you know in the tent where they can learn from others and, and our reporting uh, process also helps them learn because they can look at the, all the questions we are asking and they can ask themselves, okay, what are we doing here? Uh, what can we do better? What are our competitors doing? Because everyone in PE and VC is pretty competitive. That, that's one other thing, and I think there's de a definite kind of I don't know it's sort of FOMO um, going on. You know, GPs are, are always looking at what the other GPs are doing and where they're being more inventive or kind of pushing boundaries. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of competitive spirit is driving them on a bit as well. Uh, and and the, we we try to we try to help both ends of the spectrum as much as we can. We do quite a bit with the more sophisticated end around net zero and, and all sorts of different things, but. You know, we've held workshops and, uh, and other uh, kind of, we, we, can, we convene and, and really try to target the investors that through our reporting we can tell aren't doing the kind of things that they could be doing uh, and, and try to help equip them with that. Uh, and then the reporting itself, obviously their LPs, their, you know, the pension funds investing in those GPs can ask to see the private uh, reporting. So we have two versions of our reporting. There's a transparency uh, report, which any anybody can see, and it's kind of a cut-down version. Uh, but a more detailed version with the assessment as well. So we rank them, you know, each GP out of five stars. The LPs can ask to see that. So again, you know, going back to Simon's point, where they're trying to be more responsive, uh, you know, in, in some quarters to, to their LPs, they can take a look at that, and, and you know, obviously the. The, the assessment scores drive them forward. Um, oh, the, the, the less kind of, yeah, the less interested <coughs> asset owners. So, I mean, I mentioned sovereign wealth funds earlier. Um, we, we, we are working on that. We've got people on the ground now out in, uh, in Dubai and, and places to, to try to engage more with those uh, sovereign wealth funds and, and bring them aboard. I think there's a big issue for them around transparency themselves. So, you know, our, our, the asset owners have to report um, and, and they're not necessarily organisations that kind of enjoy too much uh, too much transparency. There are a number, it's fair to say a number of sovereign wealth funds who really do care. Yes. Your, so, your, so I, yeah, I should have said that. So, for example, the Nor Norwegian sovereigns, um, you know, they're, they're active signatories. It's uh, but but yeah, a, a subset of the sovereign wealth funds. Okay, we've got two final questions. Let's try and sneak them both in if we can. So, Hi, uh, Omar Salam, Head of Legal at Algebra. Um, can I just ask about um, uh, the um, what you, firstly, whether you think regulators are properly tooled up to put in place the incentives that you describe in terms of uh, mandate, objectives, people, expertise, uh, and so on. And secondly, where do you see the, the where do you think the demarcation should be in terms of determining what societal preferences should be pursued between uh, governments, legislatures, and regulators? Sorry, can you just say that last question again? So, so where where do you see like the, the in terms of converting societal preferences into incentives? Where do you see uh, you know, the dividing line between what's decided by governments and legislatures, like the, 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 um, the, the, the um, uh, um, corporate DD uh, directive, and uh, what's decided by regulators, you know, bearing in mind that in the UK, there's going to be uh, a big expansion of the scope of the rule book uh, for the, the regulators uh, compared to how it was done previously when we were in the EU. And if we could just sneak in the very last question. Okay, so I, I'm Oran Fear. I'm a visiting scholar from Israel, which is one of the leading countries in private equity investment. So actually I have uh, two questions. I'll try to ask them quickly. The first question is, how do you understand or analyze the recent cases in crypto markets as FTX or Binance in which private equity funds invested in these firms without taking any minimal due diligence. And my second question is, say, if I understand you well, you uh, offer to impose Picovian taxes in order as a, an internalizing mechanism for uh, negative externalities. So these Picovian taxes are highly uh, 
debated and challenged. And the main argument against Peruvian taxes is that in most of the cases, it's impossible to accurately and precisely uh, measure the value of the negative externalities. And if these taxes are not imposed accurately, it causes uh, significant inefficiencies. Gosh, well. They're four really great, tough great questions. questions for three minutes. They're, Over to you. They're great questions. Thank you for them. But, um, but I fear they're too difficult for me to answer, certainly in three minutes. So first of all, Omar, you're, thanks for your great questions. The, 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 the first question on do I think regulators are properly tooled up? Uh, I mean, the answer to that is I, I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, and it probably varies which regulator we're talking about. But I suspect the answer is not. Um, and I, I, I certainly think that some of the regulation I've seen coming from regulators suggests that they uh, aren't uh, properly um, on top of the complicated market dynamics that are at work, which mean that they are finding it difficult to design effective regulation. So, I, I mean, I, I suspect they could always do better, but certainly it looks to me like um, there are plenty of areas at the moment where they could do better. Um, as, re as regards to the, the distinction between regulators and governments, I'm not sure. I mean, clearly, it, it seems to me that governments being more obviously politically accountable um, than regulators probably need to deal with the issues that are more politically difficult, and they give regulators mandates, and regulators have some... Uh, authority within the scope of those mandates to design the effective regulation. I'm, I'm not sure if that's properly answering your question, but for me, the question is always, what's the market failure? So why is the market not addressing this problem? Or is it addressing this problem? And regulators just don't realize that, that, that the market is already addressing this problem. And if the market is addressing the problem, then there's no role for a regulator. If the market isn't addressing the problem because there are some externalities that aren't being properly accounted for in the market's response, then how can we uh, how, how, how can we design a regulation which changes uh, which changes that? And that's a complicated, difficult thing to do. But I suspect regulators are more better equipped to do that at a technical level than governments, who are probably better equipped, or at least better better qualified to set the direction of travel and the policy uh, for regulators rather than to draft the detail. But I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not. Coming to, the, to your questions, also excellent questions, I, I, I can't claim to be an expert in how taxes ought to be designed. And if, if carbon tax is the wrong answer, then, um, then you know, we need to find another way to address use of carbon. I don't, my own instinctive reaction is that finding a way to tax carbon effectively is the right way to discourage people to build carbon intensive business models or to sustain carbon intensive business models but um, I, I'm, there are many people and you're probably one of them who know a lot more about that than I do and I, I would leave it to them to work out what the most effective way is to shift those incentives or, or my contribution is just to say the obvious which is we need to find a way to shift the incentives um, I, have, I don't know really anything about FTX other than what I've read in the paper so I find it difficult to comment on that. I mean, I observe that that's mostly venture capital rather than private equity, and I have studied and worked mostly with private equity firms, but I'm not trying to say that that's a good answer to that question. It's obviously not. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk. I don't know whether I need to look to you for legal advice around what, <laughs> what, what I can say. But no, look, if you take what's been reported in the press at face value, but, you know, let, let's say, I, I think it does, it, it, it was more VC investors, but also some asset owners, some big public you know, st state pension funds you know, in North America uh, and Asia uh, and others that directly invested. Um, and you know, the, the VC firms, for example, involved in this, I don't think uh, are, are PRI signatories, um, but, but we've been doing an increasing amount on VC, and it, this is one of the, 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 the things we identified, is that kind of rapid uh, due diligence uh, that's undertaken in, in VC is very kind of quick, often uh, to be done, potentially quite superficial. Uh, and again, if you kind of listen to what the press is saying, the you know the, the person involved, Sam Bankman-Fried, was playing um, 
video games while, while pitching the business to, to the VCs and they, they still managed to, to, to love him. But, um, and then again, so, you know, clearly in, in my mind, v, I think there are two models in VC. There, there's the, the found, this founder-friendly approach, which is basically, okay, here's $25 million, go and make me some money and we don't really care how you go about it. And then there's another part of the industry that's you know, a bit more kind of maybe old fashioned in the VC sense. It, it's about kind of bringing expertise and connections and, 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 and really kind of helping those businesses. But here, clearly a founder friendly model seems to have been applied. Um, and yeah, with fairly disastrous consequences, uh, complete kind of governance, lack of governance, like, lack of anything. Yeah, I don't know what else to say on that. No, well, that seems like a good point to leave things on. <laughs> um, uh, I'm sure you'll agree, um, absolutely wonderful questions from the floor, which is always the litmus test of a great event. So if you could just join me in thanking uh, Simon. <laughs>